This is a follow-up lecture, as he, being, as he said. So I'm just going to remind you of what we've done the previous time. nurses do in ICU, just a reminder, as we've discussed last time, our main focus is to monitor for, for monitoring. It's not just monitoring, it's for early recognition of problems so we can do early intervention. And, and these, this slide is the golden thread that runs through the whole presentation. In the meantime, we, we maintain bodily functions, prevent complications, and allow the patient's own healing to occur. We administer prescribed treatment, and that can differ from medication to ventilation to dialysis to ECMO, as it is prescribed. Very important for us to use the emergency preparedness and safety. And whenever I talk about something, this is embedded in there. So what did we do last time? We talked about the team, a brief timeline for the morning. Normally, it's the only thing that you have control over is the first part of the day. Um, the specific challenges that ICU brings to us for patient care, the environment and safety steps to be taken, monitor ICU chart, management of pain and comfort, medication administration, that included infusion pumps and IVs. So what are we doing today? Just to add on to finish it all, is to talk about the oxygen administration and it will, that will obviously include ventilation and proning and just some general points of care as we go along. So COVID causes an oxygen deficit for the patient. And so oxygen is the main drug that we need. Now, oxygen remains oxygen, and it's just the way we administer it that differs. And the device we choose is, is depending on what is suitable for the patient. So we already discussed the stepwise plan in previous presentations. Um, for oxygen administration. So I'm not going to talk a lot about the decision making, but more about the related care. So the first thing is the simple nasal cannula. It's the one that we know all along. It gives us um, an oxygen flow from one to six liters. The problem with the nasal cannula is it prevents um, cooling it, it causes mucosal injury. It cools the mucosa and it dries it out. And not only mucosal injury, but also skin injury around the nose and over the ears. Easy way, easy to use, most, mostly comfortable for the patients. Now you've seen this table uh, at nearly every blood gas machine. What it does, it's, it tells you that for a certain liters per minute, you have a certain FR2 that you administer to the patient. And as you increase the flow, the presumed FR2 increases. That's good and well. It assists with um, estimating how much oxygen you are giving to the patient. It facilitates all the calculations. The problem with this is that the patient draws air from the environment around. And the, Patient who is hyperventilating with a higher minute volume sucks in more environmental air and eventually there's more dilution. So you may find that the hyperventilating patients, which we see in COVID, um, do not get the full percentage here due to dilution. So we, we may give less than what we think. So it's important to observe the patient's response. And remember this patient can also be prone. The next step is a reservoir bag, mask or a mask with a reservoir bag. We all know that as the poly mask. You can give it at a minimum of 15 liters of flow. It, the mask can be applied over it as seen here. In normal breathing, it can give us a percentage of up to 60%. The reservoir bag must be filled with oxygen and move slightly with me breathing up to a third. Now, if you look at this one on the screen, it looks a bit flat. And the patient may not get the full benefit of this device. So when you start it, make sure that the bag is fully inflated. If the patient draw large volumes of air from the reservoir and the reservoir is collapsing, either your flow is not high enough and it should not be less than 15 liters per minute, or it's time to step up with a ladder. This can also be combined with a wake proning. Next step on the ladder is high flow oxygen. 
Now we've heard all about it. It is the way we try to keep patients off the ventilator by administering this as effective as possible. Now with a simple nasal cannula, we go to six liters and with this one, we can go to 60 liters. It's important to note that all this air must be humidified and heated because of the high flows. And one of the benefits of these high flow devices is the fact that they all include heating and humidification. And therefore it's more comfortable to a number of patients, less drying of secretions, less drying of the mucosa. The cannula itself is more comfortable. Now, as you can see on the screen, there are many devices and there's many from many years um, that we've got and they still work well. Now the latest one and the one that uh, is the one that we use mostly recently is the AIRVO and I'm going to spend some time on that. A word of warning, not everything that looks like an IV is an IV bag. As you can see on the screen there is an IV bag but it's not IV, it's actually water that flows into the canister for the humidification. Please be careful. The risk is not so much that you might put up saline or ringers into the device, but you might inadvertently administer the water IV. So we always mark it not for IV use, and it is a little risk involved in this device. So let's talk about the airway. There's lots of questions and concerns and, and, and some people struggle to set it up initially. So just uh, to start off, is there's an app available that you can download on your phone, which I find particularly useful. And you have the opportunity to actually practice on the screen, pressing for three seconds, increasing flow, decreasing the flow to see how the machine will respond to you. So that is, that is useful and it has helped a lot of people at, the, at present. So how does this machine work? The high flow that's generated, this, the high flow of 60 liters or a little bit less thing, is generated by the machine itself. So you can see at the back, it sucks in the normal uh, room air and there's a pump that generates the pressure and the higher flow. So the flow that is delivered to the patient is not determined by the flow from the wall. The patient is connected to a flow meter on the wall for oxygen, and that is mixed in this device with the flow, the, the, the air that comes in from the environment. So the, the flow set on the wall determines the FI2 and not the, the flow that the patient receives. The pump determines that. So there's two schools of thought. We've heard both of them. The one says start high and reduce the flow in FI2 based on the response. Other people say start lower and titrate up as you need it. I've seen no evidence yet for, the, uh, for either which one is better. So it's important for the individual nurse or the patient carer to understand the doctor's treatment plan and to get in line with that. It's, it's not a time to have your own plan. In generally, we set the temperature at 37 degrees and it's delivered via heated tubing. Just a word of warning, there's a warm plate involved in heating this up. Um, the flow, which is here set at 35 liters per minute, we can increase that up to 60 liters per minute. And then the FI2 in this uh, example, it's 21%, it's determined by the flow of the flow meter on the wall, bringing oxygen. If there's problems with low flow, low oxygen pressures in the system, we'll have a problem with the FI2. It's most important to monitor the patients. Now we expect most of them to, in, to improve and they will. It is important to monitor the patient's response <clears throat> because that we don't get uh, falsely relaxed thinking that this patient is fine. In the meantime, we should have intubated. So we monitor via the ROX index, the RAS score, and the patient's clinical index, clinical picture. Um, for monitoring, for writing it down, always a problem. Uh, on the ICU chart, the mode of delivery of oxygen is there. The mode of ventilation at this stage, the patient is still spontaneously breathing. The delivery device and the FI2 and the flow is recorded, and the ventilator rate is the patient's breathing rate. I'll talk about the rest just now. So 
A reminder about the ROCS index, we heard about it last week as well, it's in the literature. Um, to make things easy, there's a calculator that you can download on your phone and, and here's the predictors of uh, failure for high flow nasal cannula. The problem with high flow nasal cannula is it may get people falsely relaxed. We proceed up the ladder and we now go to non-invasive ventilation. That is CPAP and some bilevel pressure support. It's, it detects the patient's breathing and delivers a, a, a preset pressure. It can be delivered via different interfaces. You see an example of a, of a small face mask or a full face mask. It can be delivered, delivered by some nasal cannula as well. Um, we heard last week when the doctor talked about, the professor talked about the, the leak and the accompanying sounds. And uh, here a leak is, is often present. And if it's not interfering with ventilation, we can allow the leak. Cannot emphasize enough to monitor the patient's response or the patient's lack of response here. Important to do mouth care, although um, the patient may desaturate, the mouths get very dry and um, they are prone to mucosal injury and discomfort. And we don't want to increase the patient's chances for ventilator-associated pneumonia. Observe for desaturation and consider that aerialization may be present, so wear the PPE at all times. The problems with this is that the patient get gastric distension from this high pressure flows. Mucus plugging, uh, secretion buildup inside of the mask that needs to be cleaned, oral and nasal dryness. And when the air leak is around the nose, we find that the patient's eyes get very dry and you may have to make plans to moisturize the eyes with, with some drops. Um, large leaks is a problem and it, the tubing may obstruct. Um, the device, I'm still not going, I'm not going to talk into detail about the device. There's uh, specific ventilators for non-invasive uh, ventilation, but there's also the latest ventilators can do invasive or non-invasive ventilation, and it's based on the setting. If the patient needs to be intubated, intubation is a trouble time in the ICU, especially in the time of COVID, there's high risk of aerialization. It takes longer than usual, and the patients are at a high risk for cardiac arrest. Um, the patient may not be adequately pre-oxygenated because of the concern with back valve ventilation. So it's all about preparing, 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 and get your um, stock ready. And that is why environmental uh, control is so important. Um, I'm not going to talk about the intubation itself. I mean, that's been discussed elsewhere. But uh, as an assistant, please make sure that you restock the emergency trolley immediately. We've heard about um, multiple intubations per day, and we need to be ready at all times. Intubations take a bit longer because we have less staff involved, so make sure that it's the best, most skilled staff that's involved in the process of intubating a patient. And that decisions are generally made by the shift leader. Now the patient is intubated and he's on a ventilated, invasive ventilation. And it's always, the first thing is airway. The ABC starts with airway and, and it's like this as well. The airway must be secure and not leaking. Now you can see I've, I've posted here a few different ways of the airway can be secured. It's plaster, tracky type, uh, securing devices. It doesn't matter which one is being used. That airway must be secure enough to withstand turning, moving, all the different procedures, coughing. Um, each one has got its pros and cons and it's, it doesn't matter about personal opinion. It's all about what works best for the patient. When you turn, hold on the, when you turn the patient, make sure that you hold on to the tube. Now it is important to make sure that that tube stays in place. The gold standard is the x-ray. We all know intubate and do a chest x-ray to confirm placement, but we can hardly do that hourly. So we look at air entry and we listen for air entry and chest movement if the chest is moving bilaterally. And that is 
how we determine, and if the ventilator is ventilating adequately. Now, even if the tube is secure, the cuff needs to form a seal. And I've put a picture here of a cuff where you can see <clears throat> the function of the cuff. The function of the cuff is to keep ventilation in the lower respiratory tract and to keep the oropharyngeal secretions from entering the lower respiratory tract. So uh, to maintain a good seal is important. If the seal, if the cuff uh, is not inflated enough, the patient is prone to ventilator associated pneumonia and he will lose ventilation. Um, how do you know it's not sealing properly? The patient will give you the noise. And by the time you hear a noise, it is a large leak. So in generally, how do we know that the patient has a leak? As you can put your stethoscope here and you can listen. Now, I've learned the habit to, to listen to air entries, left, right, and then put my stethoscope on the neck and listen for a leak. It's a habit that is easily to, to start. And it detects a leak very quickly and you get used to listening to that. So all cuffs deflate over time. One of them stay as is. And that is why we need to do cuff pressures. And we measure them six hourly or after we've worked with the airway, uh, suctioning or, or bef preferably before mouth care. So uh, to make sure that there's no leak. Also, when you've turned the patient, check that the centimeters is the same that it was before. We measure the centimeters, the depth of insertion and centimeters at the teeth or at the gums, whichever is applicable. Also related to this is mouth care. We cannot have the oral flora, you know, the contaminants from the mouth. We cannot have that entering the lower respiratory tract. So mouth care is important to make sure that the mouth is as clean as possible. We do that with the fluorohexidine solution. And when you work with a circuit, you need to be working very sterile. We must remember it connects directly with the patient's lungs and alveoli. Um, every connection should be regarded as a sterile connection and it shouldn't touch the linen, the bed, the patient. Elevate the head of the bed to, 30 to 45 degrees, ideally if, you, if the patient tolerates it. And what you can see nicely here is that one of the nasogastric tubes are secured to the ET tube. It works well in an emergency, but in a longer situation, uh, the risk of pulling out both when there's traction on one is too high and we generally do not secure them together. Um, remember about these patients, they will be sedated and a number of them will be paralyzed. So the position that you leave him in is the position he's going to stay in until you touch him again. So make sure that the patient uh, is it a neutral position? Make sure of the limbs are not look not getting hooked or abnormal positions, and not lying on the lines. And you know how the nurses are about creases in the bed. There's a good reason for that. So now let's talk about the ventilated patient. Um, you can see this patient. Um, he's ET tube. There's no traction on the tubing. And that is important and it should be noted that the patient can extubate himself or displace his ET tube by moving the head. Never mind rotation, but also flexion and extension. So please be very careful and make sure that there's no traction on the circuit at all times. You can see that they use here a closed suction device and we don't suction a lot. Um, we normally say BD and we need it. And when does a patient need it? When he coughs or when you can see the secretions. Um, so we do not suction and it's very important that these patients get very oxygenated. Uh, suction should be short, it should be sterile and don't disconnect if at all possible. Prevent desaturation, they often start at the low base in any case. There's no HME visible here because they're using active humidification and the principle is the same, it's hot and humid air. 
which either, whichever method is used. We monitor the effectiveness of ventilation mostly via arterial blood gases and we'll have to show you that when you are at the bedside for those who are not familiar with it. It's um, quite easily to, to um, get from our arterial line um, provided you follow a few rules. So I've talked about the position of this patient, the head of bed must be up. Uh, no creases, no linen, you must not lie on the devices. And it, it takes a, it's a good habit to check everything before you leave the patient. Sedation assessment is important here and pain management. The patients talk a lot about the pain related to the ET tube. Safety, when we talk about the um, ventilator, Let's start with if it has wheels, it needs to be locked so that it's, don't, it's not moving around in the unit when you're working and pulling out the ET tube. Alarm should be set by the most senior person, uh, mostly will be your shift leader, and it must remain blocked, unblocked at all times. Respond to the alarm, and most of the ventilators tell you on the screen what is the problem, and if needed, call for help. Uh, call for help means call really for help and make sure that you get it. Most alarms are caused by blocking or dis disconnection. So if it's blocked, maybe kinked, patient may be biting, there may be a lot of secretions and be careful of disconnection. It also means sterilization. So how do we monitor ventilation? Now it's a one line introduction to the screen of the monitor is as follows. You'll see at the bottom the round, and this is a common ventilator used around. On the screen will always be a grouping of settings. What is the actual settings delivered to the patient? There will be another grouping of, of readings, which will be a numerical value, and then the graphs, the graphs. Uh, interpretation of the graphs takes some practice and as a start just get in line with the expected outcomes for the numerical values. That's where we set the alarms and make sure that you understand what, what is happening there. Okay, so for all patients at minimum, whether you are in a nasal cannula or in a ventilator, what we monitor remains the same. It's just how we monitor the difference of key. We measure the level of consciousness via enrichment agitation score, sensitive, it works well, the ventilatory rate, the ventilatory pattern, easier on the ventilator, and the patient effort, which you can see, but you can also measure on the ventilator now. Heart rate, use of accessory muscles, pulse oximetry, and patient ventilator synchronization. It's often not the patient fighting the vent, it's the vent fighting the patient, and make sure of the settings before we sedate. Now we need to answer, when we monitor a patient on ventilation, you need to answer the question, does the ventilator or the current settings, does it benefit the patient? Is the patient improving? Now remember that ventilator, ventilator cannot fix any problem. It must deliver breaths to the patient while the lungs or the rest of the body recovers. So we need to make sure that the ventilator settings is working for the patient. Now, when you're working with a ventilator and you need to record the settings as accurately as possible, it will be best if that is shown to you when you're next to the ventilator. There are just too many types, too many settings, and too many variables for me to show you how to do that. The principles remains the same. Make sure that you understand the settings, the readings, and what, what is our expected outcomes. What do we want for this patient? And sometimes we want less than textbook values, we want adequate values. Now the quality of our monitoring determines the quality of the decisions made. So be accurate to make sure that you do it right. Most and probably all ventilation changes have the potential to change the patient's hemodynamics. 
we might have a patient who's already hemodynamically unstable and already on inotropes. So when a ventilator change is being made, don't turn around and walk away. Stay around with the patient, tidy up the environment, check your alarms, make a recording, but just stay around to see how the patient tolerates it. It takes a few minutes to, to show full effect. Um, just remember, in the case of COVID, there's not something like elective ventilation. The patients who are ventilated here is already got some component of multi-organ dysfunction. So it's not about the ventilator alone, it's about total patient care. And the ventilator hemodynamic interchange is quite important here. Of course, we talk about proning. Now we've heard about the benefits of proning and it starts right from admission, from the na simple nasal cannula right to the ventilated patient where the benefits of proning is well documented. I'm going to focus on the how of the proning rather than the why. <clears throat> we've had that discussed. There's many ways to prone. Many teams have their own ways of doing it. I'm going to show you one way that works relatively well. Now, proning is the one thing where teamwork is really important. The team leader is the most experienced person, normally at the head. And there's only one boss, and that's the team leader. We prone them normally for about 16 hours or longer than we used to. And the whole procedure actually takes a short time. It's the preparation and setting up that should take time and don't be hurried through pe preparation. Take your time in preparation and make absolutely sure that we're ready to turn before we turn. So I'm gonna show you a quick video related to proning, one method of proning the patient, and then I'll talk about it again. This is an instructional video for proning an intubated patient with suspected or proven COVID-19. Start by clarifying team member roles. You'll need an airway lead and at least four manual handlers. The airway lead at the patient's head is responsible for coordinating the procedure. Have at least two people on either side of the patient. I Can you see the video? Turning the patient in order to prone. Plan to turn the patient uh, I can't see the video. Just get the audio. Uppermost. Okay. Now? Uh, no, it's not by team member. Sorry, can you see it now? Uh, no, so we're still just seeing your PowerPoint. Uh, you might have to stop presenting and then uh, reshare yeah. your screen to get the videos to show you separately. I think that should be it. Just give me a second. Video for proning an intubated patient with suspected or proven COVID-19. Start by clarifying team member roles. You'll need an airway lead and at least four manual handlers. The airway lead at the patient's head is responsible for coordinating the procedure. Have at least two people on either side of the patient. Consider which direction you'll be turning the patient in order to prone. Plan to turn the patient in the direction which keeps the central line uppermost. Check the endotracheal tube, central line and arterial lines are secure. Disconnect everything else including peripheral intravenous lines, nasogastric feed and monitoring. Remove ECG dots from the patient's chest. in the bed 
Take out the pillow from behind the patient's head. Place the catheter onto the foot of the bed. to one side and put two slide sheets under the patient horizontally. Roll the patient back to the supine position. Pull the slide sheets through to the other side. devices to the opposite side as appropriate. Place three pillows over the patient's upper chest, hips and knees. Place a clean sheet over the top of the three pillows. of the bottom and the top sheets tightly together, twisting in towards the patient. Keeping the bed sheets rolled tightly together, slide and roll the patient 90 degrees lateral on the command of the airway lead. Change grips. Complete the rotation to prone. Remove the slide sheets. Check the endotracheal tube and central line. Replace all monitoring for peripheral infusion lines. Place new ECG dots positioned on the patient's back. position the patient's arm in the slimmest position. This involves raising one arm to the side to which the head is facing while placing the other arm to the patient's side. Ensure there are no pressures to the patient's eyes or ears. The position of the head and arms should be alternated every two hours. Check the pillows are appropriately positioned ensuring the abdomen is clear of any pressure and the feet are in a neutral position with the calves supported. The face and eyes are likely to swell, so tilt at 30 degrees head up in reverse Trendelenburg position. Plant remain prone for 16 hours before returning to supine position, but be guided by clinical advice. An emphasis should be placed on protection of the endotracheal tube and the safety of staff throughout the proning procedure. Communication must be clear, precise and rehearsed. Pressure areas must be meticulously checked whilst the patient is in the prone position. Emergency deproning procedures should be discussed before turning a patient prone. Cardiopulmonary resuscitation may be commenced in the prone position if it is required. procedure in a video. Um, I'm 
I'm sure there will be some questions afterwards. What is important to note here is the, the pressure relief. Unfortunately, device injury is a problem related to proning and you have to be very careful about how you place your lines and you place your patient's arms and legs. Um, especially the face is prone to injury. It is not a comfortable the position. The patients don't particularly enjoy that. And one thing to check for is just to make sure that the abdomen is hanging as free as possible. That is where the benefit of proning is. Now what we do, in fact, what we do in ICU the whole day is try to match oxygen demand and supply. Now the patient's oxygen supply is already compromised. So we must understand that all the activities that we do with a patient increases oxygen demand and we should manage that very carefully. And that determines how you plan your day and how you execute all procedures. It means that you have to observe saturation at all the time. Limit desaturation. And sometimes we do a procedure and we expect desaturation, but you cannot allow the saturation to continue. The moment you observe that desaturation, pause your procedure and allow a recovery time before you continue. The fact that you know why the patient is desaturating um, does not mean that it's okay to desaturate. It just knows you know what to stop doing now. We cannot allow this patient to desaturate too far. When we're looking at eating and drinking, after oxygenation, food is important. So we need to feed these patients and they have to eat and they have to get some food. Um, it's important to manage the whole, and to sh uh, the whole disease and to shorten ICU stay. Now the easiest patients are the ones with the nasogastric tube as seen here, this line still and all you do is change the feed, prime the line, check that your nasogastric tube is in situ, um, certify position of the tube, and make sure that we don't have device-induced skin injury. Now, I've seen as many nasogastric errors as I've seen ET tube errors, and I want to warn everybody to make sure that your tube is in place. Whenever you change a feed, that's a good time to check. It's the patient who needs assistance with feeding who's going to take a long time. Uh, they eat small pieces. We need to wait for them to swallow. If they can't swallow, please don't force it. You have to observe these saturations during feed to feeding because they may have to remove the device or just move to a simple nasal cannula during feeding and it may not be adequate for them. So observe the saturation and stop and make sure that they re recover before you continue. Now there's the rest of patient care. I haven't spoken in detail about eye care. The patients get red eyes from dryness because they're unable to moisturize their eyes when they're comatose by blinking. So we need to make sure that the eyes remain moist. Even though they're closed, they still dry out. We need to do catheter care to prevent catheter urinary tract infection related to catheters. They need a bath at least once a day and we need to change the linen when needed. I still want to emphasize, remember, we must not push up the oxygen demand too high and we must observe closely what is the effect of any action on the patient. We need to do suction and cuff care. And I've spoken about the cuff care before and if you are in the unit, you can use a device and it needs to be demonstrated to you. The best way to learn is to help other people in the unit. And I want to end with this point. The reason why we are here is we are here for the patient. And the patient is in the middle and he's only surrounded by all the machines and monitors, but he is not a machine or a monitor. The patient may be in different stages of awakeness, and the more awake patient might be overwhelmed by the environment, they know what it means to end up in ICU with COVID. They've read, all read the newspapers and there's this very real fear of death that we don't minimize, you acknowledge and we try our best. 
So communication is important with the awake patient who may need some conversation or even with a sedated patient. We've had enough reports of patients who are aware to some extent of their surroundings, especially if we don't deeply sedate them. Remember, we sedate them, we don't anesthetize them. So it is important to explain to the patient what you are going to do, even if he's sedated or comatose. Look after the patient's privacy and dignity. ICU is not a dignified place to be. It's not a dignified position to be. Let's do what we can to protect that. You can imagine if, if lockdown caused cabin fever, imagine how the ICU patient feels. So talk to them, talk to them about the weather, the news, the day, and, and help them connect to the world. They are a human being with family who needs to be contacted, kept up to date. And no matter how busy you are, control your tone of voice when you speak to them, they need the information. We've heard all the talk about palliative care, and remember we withdraw certain treatment modalities, but we never withdraw care from the patient. So as a reminder, the safety rules. Where we are, pay attention to detail. Small things do matter. If you don't know or you're unsure, ask anyone. Do not assume anything. If it's not written or it's not done, and if it does not look right, it probably is not right. And make sure that you check everything with your shift leader or the designated person. I thank you for your attention. Any questions? Thank you so much, Gloria. That was a brilliant talk and especially the ending there, it's, uh, it really does remind us of the humanity and all this and how much dignity we can bring back to our patients. Uh, just by giving them that little bit of extra effort. Mm. Uh, just as a reminder to all, uh, please just raise your hand um, uh, and we'll be able to uh, unmute you. Uh, I think the jail preference has been to type a question, so you can type a question in the chat bar uh, and you'll, we'll pick it up then as well. tonight <laughs> <laughs> I think people it was a very practical talk so I think it's quite nice to have that, that sort of practical knowledge so hopefully it was easier to appreciate and uh, absorb Uh, there was a question there, I think, from Mandy. Mandy, do you want to just verbalise it? Yeah, I think, um, hi, Gloria. Thank you once again for agreeing to talk and a great talk again this evening. Um, many of us who have prone patients uh, know that the patient doesn't necessarily immediately improve, become clinically stable and have great sets. What do you uh, suggest uh, the team does uh, when the patient uh, doesn't show a rapid, immediate improvement? Rapid improvement is not always evident. You don't see it. And it takes some time, because remember the point is also recruitment of alveoli, and that doesn't happen rapidly. So the point is they mustn't desaturate to the point of becoming unstable. And if, you, if the saturation becomes uncontrolled, please just check your ET tube. That is risk number one. And if you have to, you have to turn him back. But improvement doesn't happen rapidly. It does take some time. But just yeah, I think you've got to be a little bit brave when you, um, you know, for, you, you have to, uh, I think what I'm trying to say is that um, supporting Gloria is to say that, you know, don't, don't let the patient deteriorate and think that you have to wait. First check what's going on. And then second of all, you're not going to see the sets go from 70 to 90 as you prone them. You just have to be a bit brave and you have to hold on a little bit and then you will start seeing improvement. Yeah, you'll expect a little drop, but it mustn't get out of control. Thank you, Gloria. <clears throat> Are the busy units managing to prone their patients? Um, 
apparently yes, from what I hear, but it's a challenge. Uh, the safety of proning is still in with the number of people. Now, luckily we do it for 16 hours. It doesn't happen that often, but it remains a challenge to get uh, five people together to prone. And a five is probably a good minimum. Well, I'm not sure if you saw a follow-up question to that, that was um, with the dye shortages of staff and kind of following up on Bridget's question, is there a way to make uh, pronin as efficient as possible? Is there any advice you have on that? Mm. Like in the perfect world, ideally, you would have the same team proning all the patients and they would have practiced together. Now we are very far from the perfect world at the moment. So um, I would not train. I would not prone a patient if I'm not sure that we have established the safety of the patient. Um, even if I get other people in and involve them, I will not prone unless I'm sure it's safe. Uh, there's no benefit in proning the patient and then try to re-intubate. So the efficiency is to plan properly, um, get your stuff ready before the time, and, and don't think you'll fix anything afterwards. You can't. Um, thanks, Laura. Uh, and then there's uh, one more question about during COVID, some, some physios question safety. And with open suction, we really need it compared to being ventilated, where the doctors use the COVID head suits. I'm not sure if that's a question. Uh, maybe it's just a question to say the safety of open suction. Yeah, listen, the, the evidence, if you compare open and closed suction, is quite, quite comparable. The, the closed suction is easier to achieve, and you don't have the disconnection, which means less infection. Um, the big thing for closed suction has always been that it drops the PEEP. And now we know that open suction and closed suction drops the PEEP equally far. It's how, how, much of your, how much you suction, you suction the PEEP out. That's the problem, whether you do open or closed suction. So the big benefit of closed suction is the, the aerialization that's less and less disconnection of the circuit, which is a source of introduction of infection. So uh and that's what i can offer you i've don't have experience with a head suit so i'm not going to venture in that direction thank you gloria um but just a word of encouragement from uh Ebo just to ask physios to offer support to nursing staff before leaving the unit thank you for that that's a good comment uh mm -hmm. then, connie uh, what are the significant signs that will indicate that the patient is not coping the classical signs of respiratory distress, which would be nasal flaring, accessory muscle use in a patient that looks uncomfortable. Increase of respiratory rate and heart rate. Can you use a theater roller? I've never done that. You probably could. Um, I haven't seen it happen. Uh, I, I cannot comment on that. Have you seen any patients develop subglottic stenosis later? Um, yes, subglottic stenosis, early and late subglottic stenosis is not uncommon. Um, too vigorous and too frequent suctioning? No, it's the cuff. Uh, subglottic stenosis is inevitably related to the cuff. And if people suction so traumatic, causes so much trauma, with suctioning, then that technique needs to be observed. Yeah, and the recommendation is, uh, I agree with Eber, that if possible, the team should practice that in a cold situation so that you don't have to have people involved in proning when it's an emergency. Ideally, you should practice this when you can and everything is comfortable in the unit so that you can improve the level of experience in the unit. Perfect. Thank you so much, Laurie. Um, I don't see any other questions coming through, so you can maybe prepare to close. Um, Mandy, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think tomorrow night's session is on uh, the Nick Murray. 
uh, with Angelique and Arasha. Yeah, I think uh, Angelique is going to do Muri and some other evidence on drugs that are used in COVID. Um, yeah, so that's what's on tomorrow. And then on the 27th, which is Monday, uh, David Stanton is going to do all things practical, which is really how, how do you connect it? How do you plug in the oxygen? How do you switch it on? How do you bag? All that kind of stuff. So it's going to be quite nice. It's going to be an interactive session. Okay, perfect. So just for reference, so, so MURI is, uh, it stands for Monitored Emergency Use of Unregistered uh, and Investigational uh, Drugs. Uh, and, and that's uh, basically uh, just now during COVID, we've established this MURI trial uh, just to monitor the medication that's being given to patients or the treatment that's being given to patients um, and so we can document it. Um, and we've got uh, two great speakers joining us for that session tomorrow night. Uh, but I think we'll wrap it up there for tonight. Uh, as a reminder, the session is available online. All the other sessions are available online on our YouTube page. Uh, and we look forward to seeing you tomorrow night. Thank you and have a good evening.